This episode is brought to you by Audible, and I just have one word for you. Ostrich. Okay, never mind that. I have two more words. Free audiobook. I don't know why I said ostrich. Forget that part. Although, have you ever thought about ostriches? Have you ever? Giant fast running birds. Sounds made up, but it's true. You know what else is true? Audible is giving you a free audiobook. All you gotta do is sign up for a free 30 day trial. It's a lot of free. And that audiobook is yours forever. Just go to audibletrial.com slash the create unknown and pick out a winner. I recommend you pick up Gulp by Mary Roach. It's all about the science of digestion from the mouth to the, like, the other mouth. It's, that's not a mouth, don't call it that. If you've ever read Mary Roach, you know it's interesting and approachable and hilarious. Apparently Elvis had something called a megacolon that factored into his death. And megacolon sounds like a dinosaur, but it's not. Anyway, just go to audibletrial.com slash thecreateunknown and sign up for a free 30-day trial and get your free audiobook. No obligation, cancel any time, keep that book. Again, audibletrial.com slash thecreateunknown. Use that URL, get your free audiobook, support the create unknown, and uh, think about ostriches while you do it. Please. Somebody has to. Sauce. Kevin here. Matt, tell me something. Well, Kevin, it seems that humanity has done the impossible. We've managed to break a piece of spaghetti into two equal pieces for the first time. What do you mean? If you try to snap spaghetti, you hold it by both ends and you, you bend it until it snaps, you're always going to get at least three pieces. Yeah, it the middle like busts open. Yeah, I yep. think Destin from Smarter Every Day did a, a slow mo video yeah. talking about this. Actually, yeah, which well, you should check out. We've done it. There's no more snapping into a million pieces. We can snap cleanly due to uh, like spaghetti advancements, like spaghetti <laughs> innovation. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was really understanding the force uh, that goes on w when you try to bend the spaghetti. Some researchers at MIT figured out that the kinetic energy is channeled in a bit of a funny way when you try to bend and snap this pasta, and there's a bit of a blowback. When it does snap, it pushes back and then snaps again at least another time. Okay. So you can never get this perfect uh, you know, cleaving action so apparently all of this changes when you twist one end of the spaghetti at least 250 degrees. Then it can snap cleanly into two pieces. I want to read the research proposal that they sent to get the funding <laughs> for <laughs> twisting and snapping spaghetti research because that sounds amazing. Yeah, and people have thought about it for quite a long time. Richard Feynman he was he was one who tried to figure out this mystery decades ago and he was a pretty sharp guy. Somebody who is involved in developing the atomic bomb knows something about science. Just because you know science doesn't mean you know spaghetti. That's right. But we got to know I, Justine, who is a person who I had met about five years ago or so. We did this thing at the YouTube space in L.A., but I never really spent too much time actually getting to know her before we were able to have our conversation for this podcast. Well, she's certainly one of the first. And I don't even know what to say she was one of the first of, because she's been one of the first how many times? Of a lot of things. I mean, the, the, the one thing that really struck me was that she, and she was so humble and like almost didn't even realize the significance of this, but was literally the first person on Twitch uh, before it was Twitch. It was another platform called Justin TV. And this guy named Justin was just live streaming his life. And the first person other than Justin to do Justin TV was ironically someone named Justine. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess that was built in, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. She documented her life online, something that really one of the first people to do this, where 
globally. Anybody could follow along in, in real time with an individual person's life. And not a, not a celebrity's crazy life, not tabloid stuff, but her day-to-day life and, and the business of being online. And it was really cool to follow along with at the time. It's even cooler now. She keeps doing new things in tech. She's the Twitter account I look to when there's a significant piece of tech popping out. I want to see what Justine thinks about it. It's pretty neat that I can think of encountering her 10 years ago, seeing her one way, and she was great at it. And now I think of Justine doing different things, and she's just as great. Yeah, and we actually get into that a little bit because she was in a rut for a little while with her channel. She wasn't happy with the content that she was making, and so she had like a little bit of a, a renaissance and is doing really well now. She just kind of went back to her roots, and, and you'll get to hear her talk about that and, and talk about tech, talking about phones, talking about drones, talking about... I, I was trying Augmented to think... Augmented reality? I know, I was just trying uh-huh. to think of something else that rhymed with phones and drones <laughs> <laughs> phones drones Bones? and uh, no she doesn't get into no. uh, like any sort of archaeology but you will hear what she gets into because you're about to listen to our conversation with i justine because you are about to enter the degree unknown when you first started youtube it was like, who was doing what you were doing? Were you doing tech when you first started? Were you doing the Apple stuff at the beginning? Or, uh, you know, how did, did that evolve over time? Yeah, I would say I was doing it from the very beginning. I mean, the very, very beginning. Not so much covering it, just sort of my enthusiasm. And I mean, I think I've been a Steve Jobs fan since forever. And I think I was in sixth grade when I read... I did like a book report or something on Steve Jobs. So I'm up here giving this book report in sixth grade and people are just like, what is she talking about? Who is this person? Because obviously back then, you know, Apple, people were aware of it, but it was only in schools and my mom was a teacher. So we had a Mac growing up. So I've always been a Mac user. So from the very, very early days on, it's just been something that's just been flowing through my veins. (laughs) But how did you get introduced to Steve Jobs back then? Because that was way before he was well-known, right? Yeah. I'm not really sure. Actually, that's a really good question. Cause I think I first, we first got the internet when I was around like sixth or seventh grade. So I think I was just doing research about Apple and I was a member of like Apple forums and I was like making my own websites about being an Apple fan. And so it just, it was something that I was like, Oh, so Steve Jobs was a big part of this company in the early days. And then he wasn't. And then so to kind of trying to tell that story in my own words when I was a small child, I can't even imagine what that was like. So at that time, that was all pre-YouTube as well. You know, like the, it was kind of the, I'm trying to even remember who was big on content. I would say in 2006, I mean, it was like Phil DeFranco, Charles Trippi. Um, I mean, there was a bunch of other YouTubers that don't make stuff anymore. So it's kind of crazy to sort of see them pop up. But like in sixth grade, I mean, that was, I was on IRC And there was like all these other, like, just like forums and, um, you know, all through like middle school and high school, ICQ and AIM. And uh, my first website was actually Nintendo.com. So I was a huge uh, fan of like their forums. They had like this fake little house that you would like go to different levels of the house. There was like a little swimming pool. So if you went out to the swimming pool, you could chat with people who were hanging out by the pool. Or if you went back inside, you could chat with people who were upstairs. So it was a, it was a weird little kind of a forum thing, but I always think about how cool that concept was. This was on Nintendo's website? Yes. This was like one of the first websites that I went to. So I was like, however old I was to, well, the sixth grade, so like 12. So whenever that was. So you always, you were from a young age, kind of internet obsessed. I, I mean, I don't think my parents really knew what I was doing. They just knew that I was using the phone line a lot. I mean, they kind of got the concept, mm. but I don't know if they knew really what I was doing. Did and, you have the second phone line? Did you guys uh, end up having two? We did. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The worst part is my punishments if I didn't get good grades. So if I had to get at least an A or B, if I got a C, I'd be grounded for nine weeks from the computer. And that was, that was just, I mean, that was just, I was debilitated. Like that was what I did. You know, I needed that for, for everything. That's how I talked to people. And it was sort of, I didn't really, I guess I didn't really talk to people in, in real life or in school. So most of my friends were even then from a young age, 
they were all online or any of the people that I did talk to were my friends from school that also did internet things. Nine weeks is such a random number. It's like two months and an extra week just to stab you. you know? Cause that's, well, that's when the next report card comes out. Oh. So it was like, okay, you're grounded until the next report card. <laughs> oh, so you, okay. So that you had to make it up by that time to prove to them. Yes. Yeah. The only reason I got good grades. Well, good enough. So you were living in fear and that fear drove you to greatness. It is. Yeah. I mean, my grades <laughs> weren't that good. So I definitely got grounded. <laughs> but I mean, did I had a pretty similar thing too with the internet with my parents where I know that they expressed concern at some point that I was spending way too much time on the computer. And I was like building, you know, Marilyn Manson GeoCities websites just because... I, it was so cool <laughs> to be on the computer making things that other people yeah. could see. I just, that seemed like such a revolution to me. And, and obviously that was for you as well. Yeah. And I think showing my parents the things that I was making, that's how it sort of made it okay. Cause they knew that I was doing things that were productive. I was making websites and I was making flyers. And then, you know, if anybody around town, which was a very small town, if anybody needed a website or computer help, I was like the resident IT person at like the 14. So it's, it's just sort of something that, you know, I've always done and, and I still really love it. And it's, it's kind of crazy to think that, I don't know, I've had so many hobbies that I've just quit and just have a closet full of skateboards and pianos and things that I really thought that I would really want to do. But it's like, this thing has always been something that I've loved. Uh, so when you, when you said you were like the resident IT person, did you start making any money doing this stuff at that point? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, people would pay me to make websites like $20 mm -hmm. and then it, obviously it started as I got older and realized, you know, the, how my time was basically money. I'm like, this is taking me a lot of time to do this, but I also never really had a traditional job growing up. Like that was my job. You know, most people would go and babysit or things like that. I was making websites. So it sort of was kind of that same thing. So, and so that's what you went to school for. Did you go to school for video editing or, or what did you go I did. to college for? Yeah. So I eventually ended up going to school for uh, multimedia. So it was like anything from graphic design to uh, video production to gosh, we did like 3d. We did like, we did basically everything. So it was, it was every sort of piece of media. And then were you able to intern or find a job in that space after you graduated? I did. I took a little time off and did like some freelance stuff. And then I was also working retail at American Eagle because I, I loved American Eagle and folding jeans. It's so weird. Uh, <laughs> so like I worked there and like made websites wait, on wait, the wait, side. Wait, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you loved folding jeans? It was like my favorite thing. Why? I don't it's know. Just... It's like, like, I love building Lego because it's like, so I don't know. It's just kind of like, oh, I'm like just fitting all these pieces together. And like jeans is kind of the same thing. And like fitting those jeans into the jean wall, it is an art. And I loved it. And I didn't have to really talk to people. So <laughs> I was like, I'll be over here folding. So... Did you only like folding jeans or did you like folding other things? Only Because the I jeans. love this topic. Only folding jeans because the t-shirts, they have like a little, like a folding board. So you'd have to like fold yeah. it all perfect. I was like, mm -mm. I mean, I'd have to do it, but the jeans, that's, that's where I shine. <laughs> and also the discounts that you got too. It was mm. lovely. <laughs> so, so it seems like that the pattern here is kind of creating order, uh, uh you know, kind of out of chaos mm -hmm. and not being bothered by other people while you're doing that yeah, is what you like. Yeah. And, and it was interesting too, because I, I spent so much time behind the computer that it did force me to go out and like, I had to actually talk to people. Um, so it was, it was a, it was a good thing, but I mean, I'd prefer to sit alone in a room on a computer, <laughs> which is pretty much what I've built my career on. And I think most of us have done the same thing, but you guys are in the same room. So that's, that's cute. <laughs> we are in the same room right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We usually aren't. We usually are not. No. no. Oh. But we got together uh, physically just to to speak with you today. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Thank you. I feel very special. <laughs> it is a special day. We had donuts and and bagels and yeah. I don't of, usually uh, eat until like two p.m. So this was a big day. What? Yeah. I've already had three breakfasts by two. <laughs> that's that's like the, the, the Hobbit plan. I was going like to say, Sam Wise. <laughs> third Zs. I don't remember how that went. It's been a while since I read the, those books. Eleven Zs. That's Eleven what it was. Eleven Zs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like that's a, a reasonable point about creating 
order and doing it on your own, because I think back to what it was like to do to do stuff in HTML. And you're in these old programs like BB Edit and Hot Dog. And like, you know, that's what I remember from 94, 95. And yeah. you had to start something with a tag. You had to do something somewhat specific after that. And then you had to close it out. And that whole thing had to be nested in a, a greater scheme. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you could do that without really anybody changing it, bothering you, influencing what happens. It's just kind of you and the code, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's interesting too. And and I thought that programming was what I wanted to do. So through high school, um, I think I was like probably ready to graduate. I was in like another programming class where we did like C++, mm. um, Java and a bunch of other stuff too. And I found myself more into making the programs look better. So like I was really getting into making the interfaces and everyone was so impressed how good my interfaces mm-hmm. looked and theirs didn't look so good. But then it was kind of that flip thing where my code wasn't so mm-hmm. good because I spent so much time working on making the interface look good. So then I would end up having somebody else help me with my code. I would help them with the interface. And then the instructor was probably the best piece of advice that I got. He's like, you do realize you don't have to just code. You could go and take that direction into doing, you know, interface design or graphic design. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So from there, then I sort of shifted what I wanted to do. And I focused a lot more on making websites and doing graphic design and photography and then video. But it was so hard back then because video cameras weren't really a thing. Like you've got a video camera, they're just everywhere. Like you just walk down the street, there might be one just sitting on the side of the road that someone doesn't want anymore. (laughs) It's just, it's crazy. So it's just incredible to see what kids have available today. I mean, kids are picking up their parents' cell phones and they're vlogging and they don't even know what they're doing because they're just mimicking what they see people do. They're like, comment, like, and subscribe. I'm like, but you're making a video on your phone for no one. So they don't really understand that concept of why we say that. (laughs) Right, right. I know. And I've heard from parents where, yeah, kids, they play YouTube now. What? Yeah, like little kids, instead of playing, I don't know, house, I suppose, uh, they play YouTube and they are a YouTuber and they do the, yeah, be sure to subscribe, blah, 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 like to themselves, like with their like stuffed animals. That's cool. It's cool I think I'm not sure I mean we've definitely created a whole other generation like this wasn't a thing before I mean when I started I I've never got made fun of so much and I will never forget the people who made fun of me and now have YouTube channels and want to collab <laughs> don't you think I forgot I I mean I don't forgive that easily when you've crossed me <laughs> what did they what did they make fun of you for I'm just like why are you doing that that's so stupid oh my god I can't believe it and now they're like Oh, check out my blog, subscribe. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe it. Like you made fun of me so many times. Um, but it, I just don't think people understood it either. So Mm. it's like, I can't fault them for making fun of me because I definitely looked crazy. I was talking to a camera. Nobody else was doing it. I, at one point was streaming my life for like six months straight on Justin TV, Mm. which was then became Twitch. So I was the second person on Justin TV to stream after Justin, which was also weird because people thought that I was like a hired talent because my name was Justine, but nope, just (laughs) weird coincidence. I wore a camera on my head for six months. Um, I definitely don't think that's something I would, well, I no, I can't say that because I probably would do it now too, but I'm going to have to think about it. (laughs) Wait, how did you end up being the second person at, I mean, you're really the first person. You shouldn't count the person who created it as you're the first user of what later became Twitch. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. Wow. Well, I've never really thought about that because I just assumed, you know, Justin was the first, but it, it, it's so strange because I met Justin. It was at the first Mac world. It's probably like 2007 ish, I think. And I saw this guy walking around with a camera on his head and I'm like, Oh my people, (laughs) this is cool. Whereas most people would be like, that's insane. Uh, so I went up and I asked him like, what are you doing? Like, this is cool. This is great. And he told me that he was live streaming. And in my mind, I was like, Oh, live. That's so much easier because you don't have to edit anything. And, and then I said, let me know if you ever want me to take over for you, if you need a break. Uh, cause I also was real into the sort of like the startup scene in like San Francisco. And I still was living in Pennsylvania at the time. So I just followed a lot of like startups. I was really early on like Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. So, um, just meeting Justin, he ended up needing someone to take over for him for a day in San Francisco. So me and my friend flew out and it was kind of like me taking over like a cameo on his channel. And then later on, when they started thinking about launching channels, he's like, well, this, you'd be a perfect fit for doing the, uh, you know, testing it out. So I did. And then here we are. (laughs) And that ended up turning into Twitch. 
Do you still do Twitch? No, I think that uh, streaming for six months straight, 24-7, it definitely messed with my mind. And sometimes now I even think about going live and I just sort of, like I have this panic moment where I'm like, <gasps> I just flash back to just being so self-aware all the time. Like I wouldn't wear tank tops because someone would be like, oh, like there's a nip slip. I'm like, no, I'm not. (laughs) No, but I would be reading in the comments and then I'd be paranoid. And then someone would just say something. So I would just be like always bundled up on stream. (laughs) And then it's just such a strange thing because people are always watching, but you also always had someone to talk to. So I would take them out to Walmart. We would go shopping. We would go to restaurants together. (laughs) And then it's like my real friends were like, we can't handle this. Like my, my best friend, like it, it caused a huge conflict in our relationship. Like she moved out and I mean, I basically picked the internet over her. Like, that's crazy. I was like, well, I'm not going to stop doing this. Then you're going to have to move out. So it's like thinking back now about all of that. It's, it's crazy. Did you become friends with her again? Or is that, that was like yes. really the end? Oh, okay. No, 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 we, we did. We did. Yeah. We definitely came friends and she's still a very close friend, but she was definitely the start of all of the stuff that I was doing. We used to make videos together. We started like a podcast. We were just, you know, we just love to create. So I'd met her um, back when I was in college and it's just like, we were like the same person. We like to, to do the same things and make really funny videos, but it just like, I started taking it way more seriously than she did. And then just the whole live stream and this and that, like it just started affecting her personally way more than me. And I was just like, this is great. I'm loving it. And she didn't so much. So that's sort of where the conflict was. And And ultimately, I chose the internet, which is so stupid. Like, I would never do that now. Well, yeah, but I think making, like, the people who end up being successful at some point have to make tough decisions that way. You know, you have to sacrifice things in order to be successful. And no matter what you're, whether you're a football player or a YouTuber, you know, at some point, or a musician, whatever it is, whatever that discipline is, you have to make tough choices that way. And the people who don't, I'm, I'm sure, I hope that they're happy with the decision that they made, you know, but like, for instance, when I was first making YouTube videos, um, you know, I was just working, um, at a restaurant as a line cook. And then on weekends I'd work at a bar and anyway, long story short, everybody after work would go out and they would go drinking or they would go to house parties. And it was like this whole big thing. And I wouldn't, I, I would go home and I would write weird jokes and record weird videos and (laughs) everyone at both the places that I worked would tell me to my face that they thought like I was strange like why (laughs) why, (laughs) like you're so weird and um people on the street would stop you and call you a creep and then just keep walking (laughs) yeah Yeah, just total strangers like what are you doing um but I that's how I wanted to spend my time when I was I guess, socializing in in those arenas, I felt like I was wasting my time. Literally, that's what I felt. I felt like this is a waste of my time and there's something more productive that I could be doing right now. And I would rather be doing that. Yeah. But it's like finding that balance now, I think has been so important because even sometimes I'll be out and just at an event or something. And I have that same thought. I'm like, Oh my God, I could be editing right now. I have so much email I haven't done, but it's just like, that is the hardest thing is to try to be present in whatever it is that you're doing or at. It's like, you still made that choice to go to that event. So just try to be there. And I still struggle with it. Like it is something that is that that every time I'm somewhere, I I just keep thinking about all the work that I have to do. So uh, it's definitely something I'm working on. And I, I just feel like that is something that creative people and successful people are always have in the back of their mind. So what sort of techniques or, or things are you kind of trying to discipline yourself in order to not feel that way? Like, are you saying no to more events so that you aren't put in that position? Or is it the opposite? Are you saying more yes to things because you want to put yourself out there and not just work all the time? Like, wh- how's that working yeah. for you? Um, I mean, I think it's been better. I feel like this year, very particularly, I just felt like as far as like health wise, I was like, I'm so out of shape. Like I was in the worst shape of my life. And I was like, I need to get my act together because I'm just, I don't feel happy. I don't feel good. I'm always tired. I'm like, how do I fix myself first? Because I can't create content and I can't be happy doing this. And it's very hard for me to fake enthusiasm when I'm making a video. So there'll be times where I'll be ready to shoot a video and I turn it on. I'm like, I 
I can't do this. And I just turn it off and go to bed or something. So, you know, it's like knowing that I need to be in a good mindset to be able to do this. And especially because, I mean, I, I still edit everything like, cause I'm crazy. So I'm still like editing, shooting everything. And you know, that's a lot of time too. So it's, I've just started trying to put my health first. Uh, just try to work out, do yoga. Um, I started doing like martial arts and that kind of stuff. So that has just helped so much just for me to not feel weak anymore. And I think that was something that was also scary too. It's like knowing that I'm so weak that I could not protect myself if, if something happened. Um, so I think it's just changing your mindset and just for me, just putting myself before my YouTube channel, like, Oh, you know what? I didn't post a video this week. You know what? It doesn't even matter. Like technically nobody really cares. And if they do, well, then hit the bell, be notified to see when I post a new one. That reminds me of uh, talking to this one guy. Uh, I was in, yeah, this guy was a, a former uh, IDF military guy and he was doing personal training stuff in Tel Aviv. And he's like, I only ask one question. Uh, I ask people, if you had to run for your life, could you? No. And if they answer no, then they need me. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, that's really the only question. And he, he's like, could you run for your life if you had to? I'm just like, no, <laughs> that is, but that is so true. And I think my mindset always in the past was like, oh, I need to work out so I don't get fat like this or that. I need to be in shape where now it's like, I'm not working out to lose weight. I'm working out to be strong. And actually, if I have to run for my life, like mm -hmm. I'd be able to. So that is a really, really good yeah. thing. It's like, I'm working on myself for other reasons than just like for looks. It's like, I need to be strong to be able to, to survive really. Well, it's funny because that's such an evolutionary question mm. because that's how human beings were able to survive is that we could run for such long distances that we could outrun predators because they would get tired and we wouldn't so it's so funny that that's like such a fundamental question to ask of a human being because that's one of the key ways that we have you know, survival of the fittest <laughs> in like the most literal sense. But that's it's not weird. why people work out. And it's not a thought that I ever even had until like this year. And it's, it's really is something. So it's like having that just sort of be completely flipped around is, is just made a huge difference. Is part of the reason that, that you pulled back on doing some of those things for yourself because you were still doing so much uh, with, with the actual work side, like you said, that you still do all the editing you do everything there. Yeah. I mean, it is. And I just try to, I think also just knowing that I'm scheduling time for myself, that I have to be better at scheduling video content and editing and shoots like that. Because before I'm like, Oh, I'll just do whatever I want, which I still have that mentality. But I think just knowing that I'm now scheduling everything else around my personal time has made everything else sort of fall into place where it's like, okay, I know like this is iPhone week. I mean, this mm. whole entire weekend, we've been shooting videos nonstop and then I have to travel. So I know I'm not going to be home. So it's like, if I don't get these videos done, it's, I don't know. I just, I do work better under pressure too, but it's, again, it's just, everything does revolve around you and your happiness. And that's just, it's so important. And I've just seen so many friends struggle with, you know, just not feeling happy. And it's just, it's, it's awful because I know what that feels like. Well, and so there's this kind of overused term right now, um, YouTuber burnout, that you, there are so many articles written about this, and then you see a million tweets about it and people arguing about it. But for me, I don't feel like anyone's really gotten down to the core of what YouTuber burnout is. Um, it seems like all of these articles do just a fine job scratching the surface of, well, YouTubers wear many hats and the revenue is inconsistent. So, um, you know, you never know what you, if you can pay your bills or not. And, and that's all fine and well. But, you know, I think there's a lot more to be said there. You know, have you thought about, because I know that you went through a, a pretty big burnout where you didn't like your channel anymore, you weren't happy with the videos that you were creating, and you just kind of, what, like burned it to the ground and started over, right? You were like a phoenix rising from yeah. the ashes. and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was also something that I never talked about either. It was just like, I was doing this myself. And, you know, even much like this year, like I've, I hardly ever post about fitness or working out or anything else that I'm doing. So it's kind of like, that's me time. Like it's not for the internet. So it's, I mean, maybe one day I'll talk about it, but I also, you know, I started these new hobbies and I didn't want to do another thing where, 
oh, I'm taking up this new hobby. I'm going to start skateboarding and start posting about it right away. And then I don't do it anymore. So I'm like, all right, stick with these things that you started this year and then maybe talk about it next year. Because I just feel like I just was looking through my Instagram and I'm like, man, I get into so many things, but I don't ever stick with it. So I think just having that for myself is, it's going to be, I think, surprising for so many people because they think that they know me, they think that they know everything. And they're like, oh, so that's what you've been doing for the past year. I'm like, yep, it's been fun. Um, but the burnout is super real. And you know, before I just was posting videos just to survive. I was just posting brand deals and I was basically just posting enough videos in between the brand deals so that it didn't look like I was selling out and just doing brand deals to survive, which technically was what I was kind of doing for, for several years until I just had this thought of why did I start doing this? Like, why did I start making a YouTube channel? What has it become? And, and why don't I enjoy doing it anymore? And I just felt like the content wasn't something that I was into. So I went and I just thought of what are my three favorite things? Um, I love tech, I love food, and I love just entertainment. So I just kind of took those three things and that's what I started making videos about. So I started doing more cooking videos. I started just focusing on reviewing tech and then traveling to fun places with my sister. But it has been interesting because I feel like a lot of the vlogs, I love making them, but YouTube does not like to send them out to people. So it's like that piece of content that I used to really love to make. No one ever sees it. So it's like I post a vlog, maybe 50,000 people will see it. And I don't understand. I'm like, this makes no sense. And then I post sort of the other content that is more um, sort of like scripted, like the not scripted, but like the cooking or tech stuff, those do very well. So it's like doing the things that do well, but also fitting in the things that I still really enjoy. Is the, the, the vlog performance being low? Is that a new thing? Is that an algorithmic thing? recent thing? I have no idea. It's just been happening for the past year. And I was like, well, the amount of effort and time and personal, like mental energy that it goes into vlogging. I was like, it's not worth it for me to vlog anymore. So I basically quit vlogging. I just do it, you know, if I'm doing something fun or with friends, because I feel like vlogging has ruined so many relationships. Like I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And it's so sad because I'll be watching people that have like, you know, they live together and they vlog together. And I'm like, you can just see it in their eyes because I see it in their eyes because I've seen it in my own eyes. I'm like, this is not going to last. I mean, you guys are miserable and I know it and you know it. And just forcing yourself to vlog for the sake of making content is it's the worst thing that you can do, but you can't just sit here and tell someone that because you have to experience it. And, and you know, they might hear this and be like, Oh gosh, that is me. So it's like figuring out something that you like to do and then just make that. And then I don't know. I feel like now that I've focused less on my channel. It has been doing way better than it ever has. What sort of, what would be an example of, cause I never vlogged. So that world is very foreign to me. What would be an example of you doing a vlog that's forced or like just forcing that kind of content? Like, are you saying, okay, today we're going to get frozen yogurt <laughs> and you know, <laughs> here we are getting frozen. Like, I don't, like, I literally don't know how that works. What? What is that world like? Honestly, I think if you watch any vlogger, you'll see it. It's all forced. Like it, it is, it's nothing is real. Half the time you redo takes. Um, you know, I think there are some moments that are real, but it, a lot of it is like, I feel like I even turn into a different person. Like I turn on the camera and I'm instantly like, Oh my God, Hey guys, how's it going? And it's like, you just can't stop it. It just, it just happens. <laughs> um, but I think the forcedness comes from people who are doing it consistently, like daily vlogs. That's, that has to be forced. There's no way that that is an authentic thing that you can do every single day. Um, whereas I think people that vlog just, you know, not as consistently, it's a little less forced, but it also depends on the person. I'm just mostly speaking from some people that I've seen and also from my own personal vlogging experience. And does it, does it matter when you make the transition into this being any, any significant career or even, you know, a side gig that starts to matter? Okay. It, does that mess around with the creativity and the authenticity when, okay, you've got a viable channel. Uh, you need to keep pumping content on this. If it's a vlog kind of thing, it, does that kind of exacerbate what you're talking about? For sure. Cause I think a lot of people start this for fun and then it becomes a job. And then I think that's where the, the switch is like, okay, I was doing this for fun and now it's work. And so it's again, finding that balance is so difficult of, Hey, I'm still having fun, but I'm also working. Yeah, that's, that's what I've, uh, you know, even with, you know, like I consider 
Instagramming kind of like vlogging. It's like vlogging photos, you know, at mm -hmm. least for a lot of people. You're like, here's what I'm doing today. But for me, it's like, well, I'm reading again all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like I can't just post a picture of me sitting at the computer reading like science articles. Okay, but you should. Um, this is good content. Like that's like that's funny. Like it's actually great. It's genius. <laughs> you're like, today I'm reading this. You just hold up like a printed out paper of what you're reading <laughs> the website. It's, it's, it's basically like a, a, a hostage thing where he has to show the proof of life with a newspaper. Yes. Uh, but it's just like a journal article every single day. And he's sipping some tea. Oh my gosh, I love it. No, but it's like even finding things like that that, you know, to make it funny or interesting for people is, it is a challenge. And everyone's doing the same thing. It's like, I look at my Instagram, I'm like, I'm posting the same dumb pictures me smiling and I'm like half the time I like it's just it's just also it, it does feel forced like my Instagram I look at it I still I feel like it's forced and I know it but I don't know what else to do about it I'm gonna start commenting on your photos and be like but are you smiling on the inside <laughs> if I'm holding an iPhone probably <laughs> like, I, was, I was looking back I'm like my most authentic photos of happiness are when I'm holding my phone looking at it <laughs> it's so stupid so like one of, one of the just one of the most amazing things uh, about you and your track on all this stuff is that you had to create your own system for everything. You know, we were talking about what happens when somebody gets started, if they want to start something like a YouTube channel, if they wanted to do that tomorrow. Yeah. And, and we were like, wow, there, there are a million great models to follow. There's probably somebody who's, who's succeeded or, um, you know, they have a, a good setup that you can follow along with, or there's a bunch of websites or resources that can help you out. And it's a lot cheaper to have a higher quality product now. Mm -hmm. This was not the case in 2005 before even YouTube was around, yeah. right? No. Um, so you didn't have any models to work off from really. No. And, and even growing up, like my parents, like we always had like a VHS camera. So I was mm -hmm. always doing editing on VHS to VHS. So I was doing like, I'd record and then I'd it would just be like a linear type thing just from two VCRs next to each other. And I would make videos about my guinea pig. I would have, I would show my toys like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I have. Like, I don't know, ripping Barbies apart and stuff like that. So I would, I would always <laughs> be making videos at a very, very young age, but I didn't know that, you know, that I just kept doing it. And then when I found a place to post it, I, I really started posting YouTube stuff because the job that I was working at, they made me learn Avid. Mm. Well, to be fair, I told them that I knew how to use Avid and I had absolutely no idea, <laughs> but I was like, I can edit. I know how I know premiere. This is great. Sure. I can do it. Um, so I was working at a graphic design place and this guy comes in he's like, Hey, do you guys do video here? I said, no, but I want to. He's like, cool. Can you come work for my company? I'll double your salary. Can you start next week? I said, sure. Cool. I'm fresh out of college. Don't know anything. Probably shouldn't have worked for this person because it sounds super shady. It was, <laughs> but I did work for him for over like a year um, it was actually at a chiropractor's office and they had like this huge chiropractic company that did all of these, um, like seminars. And so I was editing the videos for them. So I had to figure out how to use Avid, but I wanted to learn to use Final Cut. So I started teaching myself Final Cut and then posting those videos on YouTube on Rever, which was one of the first places that you could make money making videos. I think they still owe me like $25 when they shut down. <laughs> so I will never forget um, so, you know, I started posting stuff online just to, I don't know why, just because I was teaching myself to edit and no one else would be in my videos. So I was in them. Wait, the chiropractic seminar videos you were posting? Well, I was really ended up being very fast at Avid and it was a very, they should not be using Avid for the stuff that they were doing. So I was really fast at editing their stuff. So I had a lot of free time. So I was just making videos in the office. So a bunch of my first videos on YouTube are in the chiropractor's office in my free time. But he was quickly trying to build a business and find people to help with this business. And it was growing like beyond anything that like he could really control. So it was a huge worldwide conference that they did. So without going into too much detail, because I don't really know the ins and the outs. And um, it, it was just a whole lot of things happened. I wasn't very happy there. And basically when I quit, I, I just he basically was like, well, you're not going to find a job anywhere else. Like you're not going to be anything and just a bunch of really mean things. And I, I don't like confrontation. So I just like walked out and cried. <laughs> so, and I packed my things and left and now here we are. Ha have you somehow had any contact with him since he told you that you would be a, a zilch, a zero? 
a nothing? No, but I'm pretty sure he I'm pretty sure he knows, and he probably read my book. So <laughs> <laughs> goes into a little more in depth there. We changed the names to protect the probably not so innocent. But um, <laughs> what I will say though is, you know, working that job, it, it did teach me a lot. The thing that he did do is he was a good leader. He made us read a bunch of like leadership books and stuff like that. So you know, it in some ways it really did help me. Um, a lot because I felt like, okay, so he's actually empowering me with all these books that he's telling us to read to help his company. I was like, oh, this is great information for myself. Um, and we went to a bunch of really cool seminars and got to see like Zig Ziglar speak too, which it was kind of a cool thing for me being so young at the time too, just seeing a lot of these inspirational people that you only saw on TV um, and in real life. This episode of The Create Unknown is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Justine has made a career out of obsessing over tech, out of obsessing over Apple products, over drones, over phones, and it's really fun to get into the nitty gritty of how this stuff works. It's hard though. It's really complex because you've got the software angle where Justine was talking about programming in high school, right? A really young age, she was building websites and doing all that stuff. And, and now she's evaluating tech. And I was thinking about how how modern devices work with processors and memory. And that's been around for a long time, but it's tough to really, really get a handle on. And I was looking at Brilliant.org's course. They have one right on computer memory. So they have foundational courses in computer science, but then a few on the advanced side. And they go over how memory works, uh, how, for example, an operating system manages virtual memory, goes into caching, and all of these really high-end topics. They're happening all the time in, when my phone's in my hand or when the computer's in front of me. I don't really know how that works, and I want to. Oh, and we all use this stuff every single day. And how many of us really understand how this stuff is it, it, what's many. going on inside <laughs> i mean very very few people so but you can and you can easily you can master these concepts by solving fun and challenging problems yourself at brilliant.org so if you want to do that you need to go to brilliant.org slash the create unknown because the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20 percent off the annual premium subscription the link is brilliant.org slash the create unknown so you can dive deeper into the tech that is all around us every single day that's brilliant.org slash the create unknown so you've put together this whole system of stuff and then one of the kind of themes in in everything that you've talked about is like ah, i was doing this thing and then realized i had to know how to do this other thing. So I figured that out to be able to do the overall thing. And then I did something else. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like this over and over and over. And so it's this constant thing where you you build a system, apply that system effectively, and then like tear it down and take a little piece of it to the next thing. Yeah. And when you, when you said that you had to, you kind of reinvented things to focus on what you liked. No, that's, um, that's yeah, your new system, right? Like you've done all this sure. work and now now what? Well, it's funny that you say that now because I just got like my house and studio, everything just perfect how I like it. And I'm, I'm ripping it all apart. <laughs> oh, no. so it's funny that you said that. Cause I was like, hmm, everything's perfect. I'm going to destroy it and start over. And I think <laughs> for me though, like I need new things, I need change. And that's why my YouTube channel has always been just stuff that I like. It's never a set thing. It's very sporadic. And I'm sure I probably could have grown a lot faster had I gone the route of, you know, saying inappropriate things or making, I don't know, different types of videos, but I've just always been making things that I like. And, and I think that's just so important for people to understand too. Even people who want to start now, it's like, just think of the things that you like, because if you get stuck doing a knitting channel and you don't like to knit, you're screwed and you're not going to want to do it. Um, but the whole system thing is, that is very interesting because I never really did think about it, but that is, you summed me up quite well. <laughs> and and now I know why my knitting channel didn't work out <laughs> because I, I, I don't know how to knit. I don't like knitting. And uh, so nobody watched it. Well, now I know why my knitting channel that I'm about to start <laughs> is going to work out. Well, you should just, you love it. we should just all start slime channels, to be honest. <laughs> slime, <channels. laughs> um, slime, slime and, and fidget spinning channels. 
Yeah, that's, I think we can still catch uh, a little bit know, yeah. on that wave. What if you dip a fidget spinner in slime and then spin it around and then the slime goes everywhere? Mm. Has anybody done Ooh. a proper slime spinning slime channel yet? Slime I don't know. I don't think so. Slime. I'm not sure. But it's crazy. Like those <laughs> very specific things, like there's audiences for that. I mean, there may be large yeah. audiences, there may be small, but there's audiences for everything. When you talk about um, building models and tearing them down, I, I always have this analogy in my head of sandcastles. And I always think of YouTubers as sandcastle builders, and they become kind of obsessed with build. Well, the successful ones, I should say, they become kind of obsessed with building this sandcastle. And then once they get it to a place where they are happy with it, knock it down and build a new one. And I think that you know, maybe this is not the case for for everyone. I think that some there are plenty of examples of like. The Fine Brothers, for instance, with their React series, like that's a pretty gigantic sandcastle at this point that they never needed to knock down. But I feel like for a lot of us, whether it's to be successful and have a long career on YouTube, or if it's just to kind of not get burnt out and go crazy, at some point we decide to kick our sandcastle over and build a new one. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is just, I mean, even like now, like I think everything, my set's perfect. It's great. But I was like, I think it can be better. And, you know, just watching even the evolution of my videos, I'm watching like an unboxing one from a year. I'm like, oh, my color is terrible. Like, why did I do that? The camera slanted. So it's just, there's always room for improvement. And I just think the best way to do that is just start completely fresh. Cause it's like, if you keep building off of something that's not working, it's just going to be a very, very not stable sandcastle. And it's just going to end up crumbling anyway. And it seems like that inner drive is what keeps people creating on the platform. Because if you don't think that the next thing that you're going to make is going to be better than your previous one, uh, I don't know why you go through the hassle of making the next thing, you know, and, and maybe that works for a short period of time. And, and after two years of that, you do burn out and you can't do anything anymore. But I think as long as that fire is still burning inside of you to make something better, yeah. then you're, you're always going to be chasing that. And that's kind of the point. Yeah. And it's, I think being afraid of failure is, I mean, that's really not something I've ever been afraid of because I've failed so many times. It's like, all right, cool. Well, I'll do something else. And I just know in my mind, you know, something will work out eventually. And it usually does. But even like this, this past year, I wanted to start like a production company and I did a lot of things to make that happen. And very quickly it all failed and came crashing down. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'm done. I'm going to go back to exactly what I was doing before that was working. And then when I have that stable, then I can rip everything down and start over again. So it's just, it's, it really is. I like the sandcastle analogy because it, it, it's basically what we're doing. Yeah. And I, and I see this constantly with uh, people on the entrepreneurial side, not so much, uh, you know, YouTube, but even people I've talked to who are like, oh, you know, you know, some people in YouTube and I'm like, well, kind of, uh, but they're like, how do I start a channel? You know, and they spend all of their time stressing out and analyzing these things. And, you know, they, they call this like goofy little names, like analysis paralysis, where like <laughs> All you do is freak out about starting it and never even get there, right? And like I, I try to say to people, like, you can do this and bomb and it's completely and totally fine. Yeah, especially if you first start, like no one's going to see it anyway. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I was talking to, to my niece about it a, a while ago and I was like, hey, start a channel. What's what's uh, the worst that can happen? You disappoint your zero fans. <laughs> 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 or you become a meme and then that could also be a good thing. So Yeah, that's a, that's its own boost. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you can do this fail spectacularly or quietly or whatever it is and you're going to come out of it with a little bit more knowledge about something. Or maybe it's uh, maybe it's knowing yourself better like I really don't like having to edit a whole lot. I'd prefer to go live or I hate going live. Lock me in a closet and I will just spend all day editing this thing. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know more about what you're going to like, what's going to keep you from burning out, even though this thing blew up in your face or faded into obscurity. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, you know, and you can just have this succession of stuff. And I, I know how many, how many things, Kevin, did you and I do individually over 15 years where, you know, it succeeds, it fails, whatever, uh, and it's on to the next thing, and that's all a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I think you're right. I think that people are afraid of failure, 
and that prevents them from even trying. And that to me is the saddest thing because failure is, is how you succeed. Nobody just decides, you know, they wake up one day and invent the iPhone like that. That, that doesn't happen. That's, that's not how things are created. Like it's an iterative process. Everything is an iterative process. I mean, look at Vsauce. When, when Vsauce first started, it was video game comedy. And, you know, I was playing a goofy character <laughs> named Jerry Bloop, uh, <laughs> you know, making up fake video game reviews and like... <laughs> Michael Stevens was making Mario farts uh, animations. <laughs> yeah. And look where we are today. Now, you know, we make this educational content that people love and love to learn from and share in classrooms and stuff. But that never, ever, ever would have happened um, without, you know, Jerry Bloop and, and Mario farts. Yeah. I think about the worst, one of the worst designed or like aesthetically unpleasant products I've ever seen ever. And so, Justine, tell me what you think of that original, like, hand-routed Apple design. You know the original Mac that I'm talking about that was, like, made out of plywood? Um, which one is that? The, like... Like the first, the very first uh, Apple computer that was, I guess, I guess it's not a Mac, but the first Apple where he, like, routed the word Apple in, oh. like, a piece of <laughs> pine on the... You know what I'm talking about on I this? do. I've definitely seen pictures of that. But man, it is, I've been so obsessed with like collecting old Apple products now. So I mean, I have a whole room full of just eBay mistakes where I like get excited, start bidding. And I'm like, oh my God, no, this isn't the right thing. And then I win. I'm like, I only won because I just didn't read the description. <laughs> eBay mistakes is a great term. eBay I love mistakes. eBay mistakes. That, um, that could be its own. You could start your own eBay mistakes uh, social media account. <laughs> and you could just follow I'd, I'd your eBay mistakes. I have this problem. I don't know why I accidentally order two of everything. Like it, it's insane. Like I've, I've booked flights. I've booked myself two flights. Like this happens all the time. Like I, things will show up on Amazon. I'm like, Oh my God, I have two of them. Two of the most craziest things. I bought my dog, um, a BMW i8, like the small little, well, it's not that small. It's like the kid's power wheels car. <laughs> so it's pretty big. <laughs> so he needed a car. Uh, and then I accidentally bought two of them. So two of these freaking huge boxes showed up. So I spend so much time returning duplicate items. So that this really could be a series, but I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I've ordered two, oh God, I don't even want to talk about it. My sister, it's like this ongoing joke now of I order two things all the time. We can dupe her into recording a second episode without her even realizing. <laughs> That's true. <It's> true. <laughs> <laughs> we just ordered two Justine podcasts. Oh <laughs> Don't gosh. you remember that you committed to like a seven hour recording session? I because it definitely would happened. Have. I'd probably be like, oh, okay, you're right. I did. Gosh, I would, I would love to be able to clone myself. <laughs> I could, I could edit and I could shoot at the same time. Well, okay. I want to get back to that. Have you tried um, hiring people to edit for you? Like, how come you're still doing everything yourself? Oh, geez. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've found people, but I just, I'm not good at managing people. So what I really need is I need to hire somebody to manage them because I feel really bad telling people when their work isn't good. So I don't want to put myself in that position. And it's just so frustrating also because I just know I'm like, oh, I know exactly what I want. And I'm very bad at explaining it. So I work very closely with my sister. So I work with her a lot and it's just, she knows exactly what I would want. I don't ever have to say anything. So I get so used to that, that when I start working with other people, I'm like, why don't you understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's a very frustrating process. So I think I just need somebody in between that so that I'm not the one kind of managing the whole process. Yeah. And I think this goes back to Matt, conversations you and I have had about the underlying issue with YouTuber burnout. Yeah. And that's that YouTubers are kind of expected to be so many different people at once, but it's not even just doing different jobs like, oh, I edit and I also shoot and I also come up with the idea and I also host it, but it's also being a manager of delegating tasks to others, which is such a different temperament. It's just a different... Yeah. physiological temperament than mm -hmm. someone who is coming up with crazy ideas and following trends and designing thumbnails. And it's just the opposite temperament and trying to switch back and forth between skill sets like that. I think that might be what is the biggest problem for people just kind of going nuts doing Very this for a long time. Can do it. Very few people. Yeah. yeah and, and even talking, using Apple as an example, right? Like 
Steve Jobs was pretty good on the creative side, wasn't he? Yeah. And he was a, a very good uh, executive in the sense that he could lead the vision of, of a thing. But even even then, like he had some he had some bumps along the road For right sure. before it, he came back. Mm -hmm. But he, you know he he wasn't um, he was an effective manager, but he wasn't super well liked as a manager of people, was he? No, and I you think know, so, his yeah. tactics too. Uh, also, I, I feel like he may have also had a problem explaining his vision to people because his mind worked in such a way that no one else can comprehend what's going on inside there. And if you can't mm -hmm. verbalize it, like I have to show it. Like if somebody is mm -hmm. like, "Well, what do you what do you want?" I was like, "I I can't. I don't know the words to tell you what. Mm -hmm. Let me show you." So you know, a lot of times I'll get edits back, and I'm just I don't even know where to start. So at that point. Mm -hmm. I just get overwhelmed and I just take the whole project and redo it myself. So I think it's just trying yeah. to find that and find a person that the personalities have to, to match as well, because a lot of times that person is now a part of your life because they are, they are being your voice. And, you know, I think a lot of YouTubers that do edit themselves, like the art is, ends up being in the editing. Like Casey Neistat says that all the time. He's like, if I gave somebody my footage, they wouldn't be able to create what I want. Yeah. And with those, with those three areas where you've got creative kind of communication management, dealing with all the people who would help you in any way. Mm -hmm. Um, and then deciding the overall direction of things like those are three very different things. And even if you're capable with all three, it's really unlikely that you would enjoy all three. Right. Like you're somebody yeah. who enjo enjoys uh, managing people or you enjoy the creative you know, and we've talked about that, you know, Kevin and I have talked about it where um, whether it's we see people or we've done it ourselves, uh, that you just fit a little more naturally in each one. And when you have to do the one that you don't like very much over time, it, it just eats away at your soul. Yeah, it, just it doesn't chips feel away. It just For chips sure. away every single day, like a little bit and a little bit until until that the big burnout word comes out and you, you just get overwhelmed. And you're like, I can't do this anymore because, yeah, like you said, maybe I'm OK at this thing I don't like, but I don't like it. And the more that I have to do it every day, it adds up and it just piles on. Yeah, like I can shovel snow effectively. But if I had to shovel the driveway every single day of my life, like at a point, you're just like, yes, m moving to Las Vegas. Bye. Yeah. Right. Well, and then it's like you're in front of the camera and I'm trying to host whatever it is that I'm doing. But then I'm like worried about the the aperture. Like, was the ISO OK? Am I in focus? What's the light? Mm. Is that what's the background look like? Is there any what's my hair look like? It's so many things that are going through my mind. And I'm also trying to be, you know, remember the things that I'm supposed to be saying. So it's it's like some of the outtakes in some of my content. It's just like me like yelling off to the side. I'm like, what, what, is, what does it look like? I can't see it. So just so many things that happen. And, you know, it's people don't see that side of it either. They just see the finished product, which, you know, is, is something that we're usually proud of, but it's like that process to get there. It's a grind and then it's posted. And then you have to be immediately thinking about, okay, cool. Well, that's over. And now I have another one and you have to just keep going. Uh, especially because the audience watched that thing in five minutes and now they're ready for the next thing. And it took you like all the stuff. So I did a video where I drank toilet water um, out of a, because I wanted to know, I wanted to know why we use clean water. Like it's just tap water that's in the toilet. And that just kind of I don't know, sparked uh, curiosity in myself. Like, why do we do that? Um, Anyway, it, it's cheap and effective is, is basically why we do it. But um, so anyway, so I drank this toilet water and it turned out when I watched the footage back, I had the biggest cowlick in the world. Like my hair, there was just this cowlick that was like boinging like a spring every time I talked. Yeah. And it looked so stupid. I looked like alfalfa. But well, actually, no, because alfalfa's cowlick was like rigid. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah. Mine was like flopping around. And oh, it was his so, had real structure, like a little rhino horn. It was his was like a rhino horn. Mine was like a, like a wild wet noodle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was not going to reshoot this because reshooting this video would require me to drink more toilet water. And I was already feeling like a little kind of sickly over that, which was probably psychosomatic. You know, For I didn't sure. get sick from oh, it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I cleaned the toilet well. But anyway, so Eric, the 
guy who does our VFX on Vsauce is a saint. And he stayed up all night that night rotoscoping my cowlick out. <laughs> oh my gosh. For, the, for a whole 12 minute video shot in 4K. So, wow. And no one knows this. Literally nobody but he and I. And and when he sent he sent me the file the next day of the of the fixed clips, it was in a zip folder called F your hair. Oh my <laughs> goodness. But that's the thing, those small little details, it's only things that like normally you would notice. And I think that's also something that I love about Apple too. Um they uh they were talking about you know specific things that they have done in the past where it looks like it is something that has been created digitally, but it's not like they actually went out and really filmed those things. So it's just cool that it's like small little details that unless they said that, like you would just be like, oh, they made that on the computer. And like, no, they actually went and shot that thing. And, you know, there's small things that even I do that I'm like, no one would know, but I would know. And I probably wouldn't be able to sleep at night. So you said something about having, uh, that you started some early work with that friend who you had the falling out with over, uh, over the streaming stuff. Um, so if somebody comes to you today, you're like, Hey, I want to, I'm going to start a channel tomorrow. Should I do it alone or should I find somebody I trust or get along with or help? What would you tell them? Like go do this alone or go work with somebody. What do you think is more valuable in the long run? I would say do it alone because that person might not always be there. They might have differences in opinions. So I think it's, if you want to do something together, do something together. Yes. But make that its own separate thing do like make sure you have your own identity. So if you have a channel and it's about you, like, you know, it's so hard to bring in other people. Cause I just recently um, was talking to another friend who their whole channel was based off of two people. And one person was like, I'm done and just left. So then the whole channel had to change and people were mad. They didn't understand, but there really wasn't any hard feeling. It was just, they didn't want to do this anymore. So it's, it's hard, but I think it's easiest, honestly, because the only person that you can trust or rely on is yourself. So if you're doing a <laughs> channel with yourself, like you're the reason that things aren't getting done. So I tell myself that very often. It's like, well, Justine, you didn't do a video today. So that's your fault. You know, there's no one else to blame, but if you do have someone that you can trust and you think that it's going to work, good luck. I hope that it works. I think we need a term to describe when that happens to somebody, when they have a partnership and then it dissolves like that. Like, I want to be able to go to somebody and just be like, you clearly got Garfunkel here. <laughs> like your pulse, <laughs> like your Simon just took off and did his own things. So he didn't want to do this. And you woke up today being Art Garfunkel. Yeah. I mean, Destiny's Child got Beyonce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it does happen in, definitely in the music industry a lot. Where, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the uh, the most Gwen Stefani and No Doubt, mm -hmm. like you know, same kind of thing. The, the the Gwen Stefani No Doubt thing was so funny because they made that music video for Don't Speak. I don't know. This is such a weird tangent, and I apologize. I like but, this already. Okay, so they made this whole music video, Don't Speak. Yeah, uh, when which was one of their biggest smash hits. It's a great production too. The video itself was very good, and it was about Gwen Stefani being recognized as the, as the band the band was kind of being pushed to the side Gwen Stefani was the one who's on like the cover of Rolling Stone and everyone wanted to meet and everyone wanted to interview the band was in the background nobody cared about them that's the plot of the video that's like the literally is the music video yeah and then fast forward like I don't know five years later and that was just reality the, the band was gone and it was just Gwen Stefani I remember this saying so well. she wasn't a hollow back girl yeah so well <laughs> that I remember the name of the video the name of the magazine in the video shoot was Sun Gun S U N G U N so they do this video shoot shoot that turns into just a shoot of Gwen Stefani and they're like mocking up the cover of Sun Gun magazine. That's how distinctly I remember what you're talking about. I yeah, there do you go. remember that. That's crazy because no doubt was one of my first concerts that I ever went to. Oh, man, that's crazy. What? Yeah. Wow. Now I'm well, just like thinking back to my first concert. It all comes full circle. <laughs> <laughs> it does. So, <laughs> so what's the term that would that would come out of that if you wanted to use the no doubt situation? No doubt. Well, but that was different because <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> my, my vlogging partner left me. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, but a lot of times like the lead singer of bands, like that's just what happens. It's so it's, it's, yeah. I don't think that's like a new thing, you know? So it's like having a personality in a band when you're not the lead singer, I think is very difficult. And 
I think with YouTube mm-hmm. channels, there's always going to be a personality that is more powerful and that people sort of gravitate to. And when you read comments and people start saying awful things about you, you're like, I don't, I don't, I'm done. I don't want to be a part of this. So I think that a lot mm-hmm. of times affects people and, and you don't really expect that. That's not something that you can be like, Hey, you're probably gonna need a lot of hate, but until you read it about yourself, you know, you don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you deal with that? You know? With, do you read comments? Do you not? Do you just ignore it? I do, but I do have on YouTube, like a really massive block list of words. So I'm like, man, everyone's being so nice today. And then I click through, I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Just my false sense of happiness perception of the comment section. Um, But it does make for a better community because people don't have to see that stuff. And this is my channel and I don't want people leaving crazy vulgar things that kids are going to see because I do have a pretty young audience. Yeah, I think that's totally reasonable. I think there's a weird perception around YouTube comments where it is a big part. It is a, it's an integral part of the YouTube experience. You know, I know that a lot of people go to YouTube and they read the comments before they even watch the video uh, because it is that kind of interactive element for the audience, but that doesn't exist anywhere else. You know, you can't write mean comments on Daredevil uh, on Netflix or Stranger Things, you know, yeah. you can't read the comments on Game of Thrones. Like yeah. that's not a thing anywhere else. So it is such an odd thing that we deal with. Even on Facebook, like something as simple as that, or on Twitter, like you're seeing the original post before you're seeing the reactions to it. Like you, you mm-hmm. get a glance of this and know what it is, whereas you can't watch a whole video from a quick glimpse. Right. You know. Yeah. What's interesting, I'll find myself too sometimes watching a video and then I'll have this thought of something that maybe I would want to comment that isn't very nice. And I wouldn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't do it, but I just, I scroll down to see if anybody else had that same thought. And then I'm like, oh, somebody else also thought that same thing. So I think it's a lot of people want to see if other people, I don't know, I guess agree with them or they want to be agreed with, or they want to just feel like they made a difference. And I don't think also people understand that we do read comments. Like we're real people. We see it. I see how much you hate me, but you're just saying that because I don't know, just for a reaction sometimes. So it is very interesting, but I think it is just a relatable thing. Like, okay, I had the same thought. I want to see if somebody else did. I I find it interesting. And, you know, I always try to try to imagine that I don't know who this person is that's Mm -hmm. tweeting me. I don't know how old they are. I don't know where they live. I don't know what their life experience is like. I don't know what they're going through really right at this moment while they're tweeting me. So with that said, I always find it interesting when someone who is a fan of my content will let me know that they hated like my new video. Yeah. It's like, why, why did you tell me that? (laughs) I don't, I just, I don't have to know. Like if you liked it, I would love if you said, Hey, that was great. Yeah. If you don't, I don't know, maybe just like keep that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard though. Because, so, you know, you guys are, you know, creators. You look at it a very different way than I do, right? And I, and I so I look at this and in a way, this is amazingly useful free data. Mm-hmm. Like imagine what it was like to create something in 1955 and have pretty much zero access to any feedback on what somebody thought about it. If it was something artistic, they're either like buying tickets to see you or buying uh, a vinyl single or something like that. But there's no pipeline. It's amazing that you guys can put something up and instantly get feedback on it, whether it's terrible or positive or find out, you know, maybe they find the shirts that you're wearing are distracting or they think uh, your haircut looks, you know, stupid or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> You never would have known this. And so you can say, okay, I don't want people distracted by by my shirt. I'll just tone that down and then eliminate that problem. So th- there's a balance between being personally affected by it, which is totally reasonable, especially when people are going out of their way to, to be a little rough on this. But at the same time, there's access to their minds, how they're thinking about and processing this video. That's absolutely remarkable from a standpoint of building up a channel, or as we talked about at a, a conference earlier this year, uh, you know, they were building, you know, freedom movements in other countries and trying to open up economies and in very closed economies. You know, it's like you hear all of these horrible things. Well, great. Then you can address those arguments before they come up again. 
Or you can sidestep this problem that a bunch yeah, of people have. Yeah, but the problem have. comes in when like a certain percentage of people are just kind of crazy. And mm. you have to, you do have to deal with that. Like there's a difference between constructive criticism, which yeah. is extremely helpful and has improved my videos over the years without any question. And just completely destructive criticism where it's like there's nothing <laughs> actionable that I can do with you just saying like you look like an idiot. Kevin sucks. Yeah, period. Like, I suck. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to not suck to you. But that's not helpful. It's so weird too. Like reading. So if I did the same video as um, like a, a guy tech YouTuber. My comments are all, you're spoiled, your dad bought you that, you, like, it's a completely different world in my comments as opposed to theirs. They're like, oh, your dad must have bought you that, or who do you have to sleep with to do that? I was like, actually, I've worked really hard to do this. This is my money. I'm, this is what I choose to spend my money on. Whereas it's like mm-hmm. the guy YouTubers or whoever, whatever, like that whole perception of, they're like, look at my cars, look at my watches, look at my money and that. And then the, the people are like, that's so cool. Yeah, bro. And it's like this weird thing where I'm like, I am just showing you the new phone that I bought. And they're showing you like this $500,000 car that they bought and bragging about it. And I'm like, I'm not bragging. I'm just showing you this. So it's, it's so strange that I don't know if it's because I'm a girl or what it is that they feel like that's something that they can say to me, but they would never say to them. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I I do think that there is some sort of sexist undertones to that where the men are being rewarded for showing off their status. And for whatever reason, you're being punished for Mm. showing off your status where in like a sexist's mind, you know, you probably like they said, you must have gotten it from your father or something, which is so ridiculous. It's so weird. I want to eliminate the issue. So to do that, I'm just going to assume that every single person has their dad buy them everything. (laughs) That says that? Like I I can see somebody on the street who's like 96 years old, clearly. And I'll be like, oh my God, your dad must still be alive (laughs) because he bought you that walker. Your 104 year old dad. (laughs) Bought you that sweet rascal. (laughs) And then everybody will be treated fairly. Oh my God. It's so great. No, it's so strange. Like we could literally make the same video about the same thing, like unboxing the same exact thing. And it's like, you're spoiled, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but we did the same exact thing. And, and the comments are so different. And I, I never even really noticed this before. Like other people have brought this up. They're like, wow, that's really weird because the comments in your video are so different than the one in this other person's. That would be a really amazing experiment. For you to basically collaborate with somebody who, you know, somebody like a, a an unbox therapy mm-hmm. type person who's opening things, you know, and talking about tech, whatever, where you guys have exactly the same script. You conspire to make this three minute video where you say the same things and do the same things and then see what happens. Yeah. See what happens from distribution to like within YouTube, how many uh, views something is getting relative to audiences. You know, you could release this at exactly the same. You'd have to the have same. the same title and thumbnail. Same I mean, you'd title, have to reduce thumb. as much, um, yeah, like differentiation to, because there's a lot of factors, uh, you know, audience size that is built in. Sure. Also, but it's different, but yeah. At you, the least, you could compare those comments. Yeah. But then people would think it's a conspiracy. So then they would start comparing the videos and they're like, wait, what's happening? Why did you say the same thing that Lou just said? So they would then start watching the videos. So that would just kind of throw everything into like a weird spiral. So I feel like it would have to be just sort of us talking about the same thing. I mean, what just happened? Like we've done some very similar videos and they would be like excited that he is excited about something, but if I'm excited, I'm overreacting or I'm dumb or stupid or I should die. So it's, I'm like, wait, wait, why can he be excited and I can't be excited? It doesn't make sense. You should die for being excited. (laughs) Yeah. That's so ridiculous. I hope it's something like, like really insignificant too, like a, like a phone case. (laughs) <laughs> you, know, you like this phone case, you shouldn't live anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's all something, but it's just, I mean, with all that being said, I do still really enjoy making YouTube videos. It does have its ups and downs, but I think it's just, again, just finding that balance and, and just making sure like you're okay. Mm-hmm. This is, I think, so important. And that's basically where you're at right now and, and what you're looking forward to in the future is just kind of more clearly defining and setting those boundaries. Yeah. And I think it's also been strange just not sharing things. 
because I've shared everything for so long. So that the fact that I have things that are just for me is it's weird. And it's so cool. It's like, wow, I have this new hobby that I don't post about, you know? <laughs> and it's just, it's such a strange thing because everybody else is posting and doing this. And I'm just like, I'm just here. Like, this is cool. <laughs> but yeah, well, that's good. I mean, you're clearly happy about that. So mm -hmm. um, it's good that you found that. And I think that probably a lot of people who are out there uh, listening to this, who may be vlogging every single moment that they're awake mm -hmm. or, or not, all, you know, maybe they're vlogging yeah. their sl their sleep schedules too, really could take some um, some advice, yeah, to ha to heart um, about saving things for yourself. Right. Yeah. And I think you hear people talk about it because I've definitely heard people talk about this before and I'm just like, meh. So you will, you, this will all kind of, I feel like impact somebody, you know, differently. So I think maybe if they don't do this now, they will down the road and be like, oh man, I remember when Justine said that she was right. I wish I would have done this sooner. So I'm saying the same thing about people telling me this in the past. I'm like, man, I wish I would have listened sooner. So it's just like when your parents are like, Hey, don't do that. And you're like, I'm going to do it. And then <laughs> you, you just don't listen because right. it's, it's just human nature. And, and I mean, we all have to learn those lessons for ourselves because if not, then it's just, you won't learn. <laughs> and so based on that experience and being around really like you, but you've been around on the stuff as long as video has been coming through. Yeah. Like, I, I'm pretty sure I watched some of your stuff on dial up like <laughs> at some point. And that's, that's mostly because I, I didn't get cable until it was really late, yeah. late in the game. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, so like you really seen all of it. You have you have a good sense of of how everything plays out at this point. So, what what, what do you see as being next in terms of broad patterns in in this whole game? I feel like augmented reality is going to be really interesting. So you're going to be able to I feel like watch content with your favorite content creator. So like they could you could be watching their video on a fake TV through your, through your phone or whatever. And then I could be sitting next to you doing live commentary about my video. So I feel like hmm. that kind of thing, like just the, just the, oh God, I don't know. I get so excited about AR because there's just so many possibilities, but it's also super crazy because if I'm sitting next to somebody on their phone and they think that it's real, some people aren't going to be able to tell the difference between I'm not actually there. And I've seen this a lot online where People think that I'm tweeting and they think that I'm talking just to them directly and mm. they get this personal attachment where they start coming up with these scenarios of things, which is so strange. <laughs> and it's like, I just want you know, this is a public tweet to a million other people, not just you. So it's going to be weird because that's going to kind of pull that barrier down of like, I'm actually in your room right now, sitting next to you on the couch. So I feel like that's going to be interesting. I feel like virtual reality is obviously going to have its whole other sort of world, but I just, right now it's just, it's too big, too clunky. There's not a lot of content and I still get seasick. I feel like I'm like getting motion sickness every time I put a VR headset on. So I think once that is sort of all figured out, then I'm very excited about all that. With the AR, you would be watching the video on your phone, but then you could turn to see you next to you on the couch talking about the video? Like this is already a thing? No, this is what I've been thinking about what I want. So it's like, you know, you, AR, you could just have wherever your wall is, you could have like that video be placed on the TV. And then I would be essentially in AR sitting next to you watching TV with you, which my YouTube video is playing on there or something like that. So it's kind of like just this added bonus content or something. Um, that I think would be really fascinating. And like, I loved the Snapchat when they did the Easter egg hunt. Did you guys participate in the Snapchat Easter egg hunt? I did not. It was really great. So kind of like AR, like kind of like Pokemon Go, but you were like collecting um, Easter eggs <laughs> and there was like a leaderboard. So you would go up to like the eggs, take pictures of them and then collect them. So like that kind of stuff, more going out real world things using augmented reality, but also like destinations. I mean, Pokemon Go was, uh, was so much fun and I love that whole concept. I caught a cute, I caught a Q bone at a Denny's once. 
And that was like the, the pinnacle. That was <laughs> that was the pinnacle of my Pokemon Go career. It's like it doesn't get better. I Q think I'm done. Cubone and diarrhea. And one, <laughs> one stop shopping. I love I, I love Denny's, and there's a Cubone right on my table. Uh, and yeah, so I was like, so did great. the screenshot. But yeah, so like what you just described, it is sounds like the setup for like a Black Mirror episode. Yeah, I love Black Mirror. It's, it's all, it's like, it's, you're watching the future, really. So is there an episode that goes well, though? Like, is there an episode that turns out okay in the end? No, no, there isn't. <laughs> There's not. I mean, we won't, I, I mean, I just, it's really sad, but I think about it. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be here to see it all fail. Well, I mean, I might be, but. <laughs> but you'll be uh, help pushing it along towards. The, I know. Uh, and coming I'm up with so these sorry. creepy ideas of sitting next to people in <laughs> virtual reality. The, the, the fact that people can't understand that tweets are not s just for them is very interesting. I've never heard of that before. Um, yeah. I had I had read a study years ago and I'm going to I'm going to butcher this because I don't remember it. Um explicitly but it was something along the lines of in early childhood development you could do this test where uh, i believe it's children under the age of four again uh, i'm just working off of memory here but you could hide say a candy bar like under a bowl in a room okay and you can show the kid look here is a snickers bar you show it to them then you show it going under the bowl and then you cover it with the bowl. Okay. So now the kid knows that under that bowl, there is a Snickers bar. That kid cannot understand that if another kid comes in, they don't know that the Snickers bar is under the bowl. They don't have the information that you have. So they cannot discern. Um, I believe it might have to do with theory of mind, but they cannot understand that like someone else has different information than them. So if their sister walks in the room and they just see the bowl, and they have no idea that there's a candy bar under there. It just looks like a bowl. Was right? that what you were reading about uh, kids being able to, beginning to lie and understanding lies because they have a mismatch on realizing that, uh, like they think if they say something, everybody else will automatically have that same experience? Like, I, I think it ties into that. I think it was when uh, I was researching theory of mind with animal cognition because I don't, I'm pretty sure the chimpanzees never figure this out. I, I'm pretty sure like a chimp can never figure out that like I have information that someone else doesn't. Yeah. They just think like whatever I know is what is known. Did you understand what I'm saying? Like everything that I know is what everybody else knows because how could anybody else know anything else that's just what the information is because that's all i can conceive of so you're saying so you're saying she's clearly tweeting to me yes if they're not following anyone else and only following me they think that that is to them and i mean it's weird i can talk about this off of the podcast because it's wild like i've got some crazy screenshots of some things you're just going to be like what <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i mean well it's horrible it's yeah. i'm sure this is a little bit worrying well, no it's sad it's sad <laughs> because that's i mean people like they aren't able and that's the thing with like video games I mean, I played so much Grand Theft Auto that for probably a year, just walking around Los Angeles, I mean, I was like, my God, I've hit people on this street <laughs> in my game. And you know, and and like, and it's it's concerning mostly because I'm in I'm I think I'm an okay person, like in an okay state of mind. But if you're not, you're not able to tell the difference between this is video game life and this is real life. And with VR, that's gonna be extra, extra scary. And just, you know, going back to also what you were talking about, like with kids, it's funny because I've, I've also seen kids close their eyes and then they think that you can't see them because they can't see. So that's always so funny. They're like, well, you can't see me. I'm like, no, 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 you just can't see. I can still see you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that scale. I forget what it's called. Uh, the, the childhood developmental scale. It has a real name, but there are all these little milestones like through the age of five or six or something where by three months, like a baby should be able to do this. And like, and I, I, all those elements I think are, are part of that scale where they realize that the eye closing thing doesn't make them invisible. Uh, or, you know, knowing that other people have different knowledge in the world than they have. And, and get, like gaze following is one of the things. Yeah. Like if you, um, like if a baby sees their mother looking at an object, they can follow the mother's gaze to the object. So like they see the mom looking at an apple, then they can go look at the apple. Like that's a pretty advanced um, part of childhood development. 
I always get so upset when my dog won't look what I'm looking at. I'm like, no, it's right. Look, look at it. Like, just look at it. He won't look at it. I'm like, but look what I'm looking at. The treat is right there. (laughs) No, I know. And supposedly dogs are one of the only animals that can do gaze following. Like they Mm -hmm. supposedly they understand pointing because that's the the same thing. It's it's what's considered like a a triadic form of communication. There's like a Mm -hmm. sender, receiver and an object. So, you know, you're the sender, your dog is the receiver and the object is like the milk bone. And you're saying like, hey, look, there's a milk bone right here. Uh, Dogs are supposedly like one of the few because we kind of they co-evolved with us Mm -hmm. for so many tens of thousands of years that I believe that's something that they should be able to figure out. Well, he just, he loves eye contact. Like he will just stare at me and just stare at me. It's just it's like looking. I'm like, can <laughs> yeah, I they, help you? They literally <laughs> release oxytocin with eye contact. Like yeah, it, it's, it literally oh, it's like so cute. makes Does them Does he follow happy. you on Twitter? My dog? Yeah. And, and just yeah. like Twitter stare at, uh, at you. Does he <laughs> think, I bet your dog legitimately thinks that all of your tweets are to him. He Probably, I don't, I don't, yeah, he probably does. I wish he could tweet. I just sometimes wish I could text and be like, okay, mommy's coming home soon. <laughs> don't worry. Don't they have he, a thing that's like a video conferencing thing? How do you yeah, not have that? Yeah, that's so mean because they don't understand that you're not in the house. Oh. And then also even like the screens and stuff, like you can send treats out. Like it's just, it feels really mean because he'll be like looking around like, I hear you, but I don't see you. So it, it makes me feel really bad. So I don't ever do that. I could see that. It is kind of more sad than just not being there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a tease. He's just chilling. He's like, I'm I'm alone. Like, I give you attention when I want to. And he's like, I'm living now. This is great. I'm by myself. <laughs> so we just we just had a, a like a long factual thing, which was awesome. But we should just we should just make something up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want to make something up because um at the end of the day, this podcast is about creativity. You're a creative person. I love creativity. And I want to have an element that kind of celebrates that. So I want us to ask her a question that she cannot answer, that she can't know. I I cannot. She has to fabricate, manipulate, invent. Yeah. Just make something up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, The question is who invented chicken nuggets? Yeah. Oh, Actually, I do know this. Oh, my God. What? It was a guy named Richard, and he I'm was like... Verifying. My, my, <laughs> my child doesn't like eating large pieces of chicken, and so the, he ended up taking huge pieces of chicken and, like, kind of blending it and mashing it all together and then frying it and cooking it. Okay. I just made that up. Uh, I just okay. made that up. Yeah, the chicken, <laughs> chicken nugget was invented in the <laughs> 1950s by Robert C. Baker, a food science professor at Cornell. Bite-sized piece of chicken uh, called the Chicken Crispy. Um, that was close. That was so close to reality. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like if you had one chance to guess lottery numbers, you would have gotten like five out of seven on that. <laughs> uh, oh. Richard, my friend. You said it with serious confidence, too. I well, know. I thought I was supposed to. I was supposed to make it real. It is I, real. I, today. I, not, I believe now you. Now I don't get. Now I don't get it. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I, I did believe you, and it was so close that it's um, it's that's, kind of scary. That's kind amazing. Scary. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because you guys both had. A, this is audio, but you guys can't see their expression. You guys were like, "Really? Like what? <laughs> like super excited?" I was like, "No, I don't actually know." But then I felt really bad lying, so I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm a liar." <laughs> I specifically didn't want to look it up beforehand because I didn't want yeah. to have like secret knowledge of like, haha, you're wrong. Like I wanted it to be yeah. an organic thing. And uh, yeah, that, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Now I'm thinking about chicken tenders. VidCon, the hotel that we stayed at in VidCon, it was, I've never had better chicken tenders. They had it like, I don't even know what they did, but it was so magical. It was like the best room service I've ever had. Like I will go back to VidCon now just to get those chicken tenders. How, are, do you, do you often, are you a uh, room service person? I always feel weird about room oh, service. Oh, I love it. You, you love oh, it? Absolutely. Okay. I'm just like, I am lounging. I'm like, let's have breakfast and lunch and dinner. <laughs> it's so good. I always find the exchange thing. awkward. Like, uh, yes, hello. Come into my room. Uh, just, just over there, please. Oh, and, to push the cart in and, yeah, and yeah. do all of that. Yeah. I'm too oh, socially yeah. awkward. I, I need to get over that, I guess, but I find it a little odd. I like food so much that I will take the awkward but it is extremely awkward when they're like, oh, Justine, I love your videos. And I'm like, 
Oh my God. That's like when I'm getting a massage or something too, where after this woman was done, she's like, Oh my God, I love like your Call of Duty videos. And I was just <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, you just saw my butt. <laughs> 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 so it's strange, but it is, it is actually very weird to think about like the people that are watching, like they're in the real world and, and they see you in real life. And it's, it's strange because I don't ever really pay attention to people around me. So I'm like, how did you see me? Like, I don't understand. Like, doesn't make sense. Does it happen often for you? It does. Yeah. It happens a lot to my sister too. Um, but it's, I mean, always at Apple stores. That's, that's where I shine. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I mean, and Best that's Buy. like Arnold Schwarzenegger walking into Gold's gym. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. GNC. Probably going to recognize him. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, I mean that I, I've seen that happen with, with you guys. You remember that we were at Outback Steakhouse or something and like the waiters, the wait staff. Oh, wanted right. pictures with you and Michael and Jake. And yeah. Yeah. But it, it it doesn't happen that that often to me. You know, that's at VidCon. There are a lot of, you know, people there just for, I guess the people at Outback didn't specifically they, get it. No, get they got that job. That week. They got <laughs> that <laughs> job near the convention <laughs> to center. Meet YouTubers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Slinging steaks to meet right. YouTubers for that week. Yeah, you're right. So funny. It's <laughs> so like I just I just want to make a bloomin' onion for the, the boys of Vsauce. <laughs> oh my gosh, are those good? They're the best. <laughs> Every single time. I will eat one of those and then I'm instantly like, I am just deathly ill for at least four hours after. <laughs> well, there's about 900,000 calories in one of those things. Yeah. I mean, oh, and then it, that dipping sauce too? Oh, it's wow. like a terrifying amount of calories because it, it, it says it on the menu and it tells you. And yeah, it's now like, that they have to print the calories, it, that sucks really bad uh, that, mm -hmm. you, that you know that this grease bomb actually is going to make a problem. Then you, you can put like a numerical value on that problem. That's, that's well, the issue. I love when I look at like a pack, like a huge pack of Oreos and it's like, oh, this whole thing is like 2000 calories. I'm like, cool. That's my daily consumption. So if I just eat this today. <laughs> <laughs> Surfing <laughs> size of two. Work right. out. <laughs> you can have like four cookies an hour and uh, you'll be set. Didn't, Matt, yeah. didn't, didn't you have a thing once about, um, or you read an article about some burger from McDonald's was like the the, the greatest value oh. in the world because of how oh. many calories it has for how cheap it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it was Kyle Smith of the New York Post at the time. Uh, he posited that that uh, the double cheeseburger on the McDonald's dollar menu was uh, calories per dollar nutritionally, like the greatest invention in the history of humanity. Are you making this up? No, or is this no, no, true? this is absolutely true. Oh, okay, uh, I was like, this sounds like you're making it up, but this is lovely. <laughs> yeah, because I know a bunch of people took that uh, that premise and and you know kind of wrote about it in economic terms. But mm -hmm. you know, he's saying you get a whole bunch of fat and carbohydrates and some protein for a dollar, and here's what this dollar means to you know as a percentage of uh, the hours you work and all of this stuff and he's like i don't know what it worked out to for the average wage but it was something like four and a half minutes of labor gets you half of the calories you need for the day and all you have to do is walk in and get this thing and eat it as opposed to a hundred years ago how hard was it to procure half of those calories it's like this yeah. would take you uh, hours and hours a day uh, so it's a valid, I mean, there was even thing. that, that, that YouTuber who did the, the turkey sandwich from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And it took him what? Six months, six months and like $1,500 <laughs> of effort and supplies and everything. Oh, so he did every, like make out the turkey. Like, wow. Wait, so yeah. got the turkey. I, I think it was a chicken sandwich and he actually raised the chickens, grew the lettuce, tomatoes, like made the bun, everything. Yeah. He made everything oh, I need from to watch scratch. This. this sounds ridiculous yeah and it cost a lot of money and took a lot of time yeah uh just to make a turkey wow. sandwich which you could get like literally at a gas station for like two dollars yeah and i saw a video of his uh, the other day about what happened after that i think that was kind mm -hmm. of his first really big one um he and two other guys there are three of them make a ton of stuff where it's like how do i make this thing out of nothing where I have to make all of the components. Mm -hmm. uh, the sandwich was, you know, kind of all built in a garden for the most part. So that was cool. Yeah. But some of the stuff those guys make, it's really complex and they have to figure out how to make different like little machines and things like that to mill apart. Uh, like it's really awesome. They've got a cool channel going. Well, we should figure out what the name is so everybody can look them up. Yeah. Because yeah, now yeah. we're just talking and like. I'm Googling it right now. 
um, it says, how, I think it looks like the channel's called How to Make Everything. Yes, that sounds right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. How yep. to Make a $1,500 Sandwich in Only Six Months. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is incredible. It's a really important lesson though about yeah. about how important it is to cooperate with other people, to specialize in something. Otherwise, this is what you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I postmates like well, I'll postmates in the morning, well actually in the afternoon for lunch and dinner, so I'm mm-hmm. like set for the rest of the day, but mm-hmm. it's like I don't cook. I I don't at all. Like it's just it's crazy to think about. Like I don't know how I survive if there wasn't like postmates or just easily accessible food. And that's just cooking. Reason. Imagine if you had to grow yeah. grow and maintain all of those elements. I can't keep a plant alive. I, I thought succulents <laughs> were just supposed to live. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, why are you die- dead? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I relate to that. Whenever people talk about like, oh, like the end of the world prepping, I'm like, I'm prepped for every situation. Like in my to-go emergency bag, I've got coffee. I've got candy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got extra yoga pants. <laughs> I've got more knives than you can imagine, but I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> the first two weeks of the apocalypse are going to be awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God. I should do a what's in my emergency kit because it's hilarious. Like, it's like the things that I think that I'm going to realistically need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coffee and yoga pants. I don't know how. Maybe you could use the yoga pants to filter the coffee. Yeah, you well, certainly I just could. I felt like I'm going to need pants, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, probably pants that would last and like not get worn out quickly though, like a like a dungaree or a wrangler yeah, or probably. something would be more useful in the apocalypse. Like I've had some pants my... that have lasted twenty mm. years. Yeah, you want I have those pants from pants. high school. Yeah, you don't want them to rip. Yeah, because my thought was I'm already gonna be wearing yoga pants and I'll probably want a fresh pair. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is oh gonna be the God. best. This is gonna be the best bug out bag review in the history of the world. I love this. Oh my gosh. I'm just thinking about the things that I have in there. <laughs> wow. I don't know. I think you should post that and then read the comments because it's going to be very entertaining. Oh uh, what people... Now that I deserve the criticism. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the preppers will, will come out in hordes <laughs> and in droves. <laughs> I mean, I have so much stuff that like, it's like three suitcases. Like where, like, if, if there's an emergency, what am I going to, I can't carry three luggage suitcases full of things. <laughs> no, you definitely, and one of them is probably a drone, I'm sure. Oh, no, <laughs> but I should, I should pack an extra drone. But my concern was like, how am I going to charge the batteries? Because the solar things that I have probably wouldn't charge them fast enough. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It would be good for reconnaissance. So you'd have an advantage of an eye in the sky kind of thing to know who is around you in a way they would never have. Yeah. You know, I, I did that. We were on a hike and it was, but it was dark and we actually didn't know where we were going. And mm-hmm. so I was like, I got to put the drone up just to be able to see where we're at. And, uh, well, it was dark, so I couldn't see anything, but it was a great thought. Mm-hmm. So it didn't have night time, vision. It didn't No, mm. but that I was like, we're lost. Like we need to, we need to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. It's so like, a night vision drone goes in the bug mm-hmm. out bag. Yeah, I think so. There's that no alternative. Would be incredible, incredibly useful uh, mm-hmm. for every, every looking for supplies. Uh, looking for enemies. Yeah. Um, well, fresh water. Yeah. yeah. All of that stuff. <laughs> obstructions. <laughs> anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obstructions. Yeah. Well, we're figuring this out. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be great. Perfect. Well, you guys are pretty far away, so <laughs> I'll be all the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but we're all going to end up meeting up at Terminus. Right. I think that's guaranteed <laughs> to happen. Did you know Terminus is real, by the way? No. Yeah. In Atlanta, Terminus. Uh, is is an actual thing? Oh wow! Yeah, which I didn't I didn't realize, which I should have. I think uh, I think Boulder, Colorado, is where everybody meets in in the stand, isn't it? Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's kind mm. of a throwback reference, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit older, isn't it? It's a bit older. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, look, this has been great. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us today and for. Um, sharing your thoughts on what weird lives that we lead, because that's it's weird. It's really all I wanted from this podcast was to talk to people about how weird being a YouTuber is. <laughs> oddity, yeah, oddity on display. Yeah. What's like when you think about it? Like everybody has a weird job. Like everyone's doing something weird. Like why are we doing these weird things? Like nothing makes sense. I just don't understand it. <laughs> oh man, I think that will be podcast number two. Is uh, 
when you come back to have that discussion. <laughs> yeah. What are we doing? Why are we doing anything? <laughs> I, that's a much deeper existential episode, I think. God, yeah. Oh, wow. I've why, got lots to say on why that. do we do anything? And then, <laughs> then you go over those some of those screenshots and comments. You really get oh, yeah. in the weeds on on some of the the philosophical strange stuff. ones and mix that in with the philosophical. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is such a bad good idea. Yeah, <laughs> such a good idea. Well, um, yes. Thank you for uh, being a part of this sandcastle, mm -hmm. and um, go watch some um, turkey sandwich videos. Oh, it's like it's ready. After that, I'm going to watch it next. It's cute <laughs> I'm so right excited. Up. <laughs> it's ready to go. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Justine. Thank you, guys. This <laughs> yeah, was thanks. great. Okay. Bye. Special thanks to Justine. You can check her out on YouTube and Twitter and all of the places at iJustine. It's iJustine because... She really likes Apple products, so, so she named herself after one. We've got more info down in the show notes. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. If you liked what you heard, please tell a friend about the show and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Podchat. Po Podchaser? And Podchaser, which is an alternative way to pronounce Podchaser. Subscribe to The Create Unknown for free on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram at The Create Unknown and on Twitter at Just Create Unknown. I like to uh, tweet a lot on there, so make sure you follow on the old Twitter. Our website is thecreateunknown.com. The Create Unknown is a Vsauce podcast in association with Triangle Content. We've been your hosts, Kevin Lieber, that's me, and Matt Tabor, that's Matt Tabor. Check us out on YouTube at Vsauce2. Executive producer is Dave Kiney. This episode was edited by Adam Ganong. With help from Adam Remunda. Our theme song is from the incredible Mega Drive. Check out Mega Drive's website in the show notes. Host and guest portraits are by the wonderful Tim Webster. His portfolio and website are also in the show notes. Special thanks to Dorothy Kiney and Paula Lieber. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode. Until then, you are about to exit the great unknown. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>